we welcome everyone that's watching by way of Facebook or through the internet. Well, we're glad to have you here in the evening service at Ranchero Drive. And I'd like you to turn in your Bibles tonight to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. <coughs> you know, if uh, probably between people, you know, if you were to take a poll or a survey, even amongst you all tonight, and I were to say, you know, what are important things to you? Probably, there probably would be some variation between from person to person, even between a husband and wife, as to what's important or, or what you would esteem as being valuable. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, we, we could be surprised by what other people think to be important, and we might think it's, it's not really, uh, really a very big deal at all. But in their mind, in their heart, based upon their upbringing and their life experiences, that this is something that's very important. And, uh, and, and I think sometimes, too, we, we kind of think that way about, about, if you will, about what is important to God. And, uh, and what he looks at and what he measures uh, in our lives. And that's what I, I want to talk to you a little bit about that tonight. Some spiritual sacrifices that are important to God. You, you might think it's just part of everyday life, but the Lord counts that as a special thing. And, uh, and the, as a matter of fact, what we're going to read, we're going to find out that some of these sacrifices that he is very well pleased with. And don't you want to please him? Amen. I, you know, Jesus, John 8, 29, he said, I do always those things which please my father. And I think that's a part of the, part of the, the nature that God puts into us, that divine nature that has a desire. I may not always get it right, but I do have a desire to please the Lord yeah. and uh, in all that we do. And so look here with me in 1 Peter chapter 2, and I want you to look in verse 5. The Bible says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. Now watch to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, we can't leave that part out right there. That's the linchpin. You know, there's a lot of people that uh, over the course of a year or whatever, when, quote, religious holidays come up, they're going to go through all kinds of gyrations. I mean, particularly when Easter time comes, Resurrection Day. And of course, every day is Resurrection Day, is it not? Amen. And, uh, but we set aside that day of the year that we celebrate the, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. It's what separates him from every other, if you will, every other religious figure on the world because their bones are in a grave someplace. Amen. And our Savior got up and uh, never to die again. And, uh, and yet some of these people, in order to, if you will, what they think is going to garner the praise of the Lord or to please him or to satisfy him, Man, they're going to put themselves through all sort of gyrations and, and sometimes a lot of pain and suffering. Or how many of you are familiar with the Via Della Rosa? Are you familiar with that? There's a song about the Via Della Rosa, and that is supposedly the way of the cross, where Jesus bore the cross, you know, the weight of it and so forth. He stumbles underneath it, and Simon the Cyrenian, he comes along, you know, to help the Lord bear the cross. Well, there are people that are going to go through that in that region, and they're going to have a cross on them, and they're going to try to go through that to imitate that. And, uh, and some of them will do it on their knees, particularly some of them that, are, that are, are, are practice Catholicism, or they're going to actually, in the Philippines, there will be men who will actually be crucified. You can look it up and you can say, I mean, they actually are nailed to some wood and so forth and they are suspended and they do all of this in an effort, if you will, to garner the favor of God. Some of them flog themselves as they walk and they chant and they flog themselves, laying open, flaying open their, the skin of their, of their backs as they believe in this penance, if you will, that's going to improve their relationship with the Lord. And I want to say to you that God has some things here, some of these spiritual sacrifices <clears throat> that are acceptable to God. And that word acceptable means pleasing to God. And how so? By Jesus Christ. 
So it's only through, as a result of the new birth in these things that we do, that God is pleased. Outside of Christ, he's not because none of that garners his, if you will, garners his favor or his love, if you will, outside of, outside of that of, of loving lost men. But here specifically, it, in other words, our relationship is the beginning point of that. And so you can offer a lot of things, a lot of people do, unto God. But if it's not through Jesus Christ, it's not going to avail anything. And the Lord actually said, you remember what he told the Pharisees? He told this to his disciples. He said, in vain they do worship me. Well, wouldn't it be a, wouldn't it be a, wouldn't it be, man, wouldn't it be terrible to go through your whole life having done all those things? only to find out at the end of your life, all that was vanity. And what do we mean when we say vanity? What we just simply means, it's futile, it's empty, it's worthless if it's vain. And so there are, there are many things that accompany our salvation. Some of them are mentioned in the verse right here before us. Notice what it says. We're lively stones. In other words, it, 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 is a, it is illustrative of our relationship to the Lord Jesus, who is what? Who is the chief cornerstone, right? What does a cornerstone do? It joins two walls. It brings two things that were separated. It brings them together. And so, so we are a part of that spiritual house. When you got saved, when you trusted Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit put you into the body of Christ, you became a part of those lively stones that make up this, if you will, this spiritual house and uh, a, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Well, so the, so the second thing we see, lively stones, but we also see a spiritual house. And so together we form part of the church of God. Now, when the Bible writes about or says things to church or about the church, it either speaks about churches like the church at Colossae, the church at Philippi, the church of Ephesus, and so forth. Those were actual individual churches, but a lot of times it's referring to, in many places, just about the church, where there, where there if you will, where there's neither bond nor free, all right, in those, in those, kind, of, in those kind of terms. And so, so it depends on the context as to who God is, teach, uh, who God is speaking to in, that, in those terms passages, but we have become a spiritual house. When you got saved, you became a part of the body of Christ, the church of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And that's what, that's what Paul was writing about. So we're lively stones. We become part of a spiritual house. But look at the other one in there. Notice what it says. Ye are a what? A holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. Well, could could anybody just go into the could anybody just go into the holy place in the tabernacle? God set aside some people. I'm reading through Exodus right now, and uh, and Aaron and Moses are getting their roles down. I think I'm in chapter four or whatever. And uh, and what's going to be coming up is that the that the sons of Levi, the Kohathites, the Gershonites, and the Merarites are going to be responsible for the coverings and the curtains and the boards and the walls. I mean, the tapestry, all those things. And then all the furniture, the Kohathites are going to bear on their shoulders with those, with those, uh, those rods through the staves on that furniture. And they're going to carry that stuff around. So it was through the tribe of Levi who were going to become the priests. So when you got out there, somebody from Asher just couldn't go in there. Somebody from Dan just couldn't go into just couldn't go into the holy place. Now they could go into the tabernacle, what we would refer to the whole thing as the tabernacle. They could come in with their offering, but they couldn't go on any further in that. That was reserved for the Levites. But notice what this says of us: that we have become a holy priesthood. In another place, he calls us a royal priesthood. All right, look at verse, look at verse nine, same chapter. Look at verse nine. Now, I'm just building a foundation here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down to the business here in just a minute. So, so bear with me, all right? All right, look at verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation. Watch. A royal priesthood. And holy nation, a peculiar people. All right? And, uh, and so here we're a part of that. And so what do we have now? Just as those priests, just as those of, of the tribe of Levi 
were responsible for bringing physical sacrifices. When somebody brought in a turtle dove or they brought in a bullock or they brought in a lamb, it was the priest's job then. They would go through all that. They would take the, take the life of that animal and so forth. They would take the blood and they'd be cleansed and then that blood would be offered and that once a year he would go into the holy place, Aaron would provide a sacrifice for himself and then provide a sacrifice for the whole nation of Israel. God, the smoke would come up. God would be pleased. I mean, he would hold back the judgment of God for another year. And there were many of those sacrifices, trespass offerings, sin offering, uh, bird offerings, peace offerings. I mean, there were all kinds of them. And yet, and we know this, that there never was a chair anywhere having anything to do with that tabernacle. Why? Because that offering was never over. You know, the only reason why you have a chair is so you can sit down when the work is done. Amen. And, uh, and so the work was never done. That fire was burning all the time. Those priests who had different, different courses. We get a little glimpse into that when you read about Zechariah, right? John the Baptist's dad. It was his turn to go in there. And he was, it was in his course, if you will. He had the job of doing certain things in the temple in those days. But now, the New Testament, we're a holy priesthood. This is one of the reasons why the church in Rome did not want the book of Hebrews to be allowed into the canon of the Bible because the book of Hebrews teaches that we are believer priests. That we don't have to have a go-between. We already have a mediator. There's one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 and 5. Hey, we don't have to have somebody else. We don't have to have, you don't have to go through a priest. Why? Because we are believer priests. Because in Jesus Christ, we have access to the very throne room of God. Amen. What a blessing. Amen. And so it's a privilege. And you and I, we shouldn't live beneath our privilege. And so notice what I, what I want you to see from out of this, though. And so now, so we're, this, we're these lively stones, our relationship to the chief cornerstone. We've become a spiritual house. The Holy Spirit has made us a part of the church. And then now we're a holy priesthood. And in Christ, because of him, we have direct access to the Father. And just like those Levitical priests, now we can go in. And how does he tell us to come, to, how does he tell us to come in? In, uh, in, in in the book of Hebrews? How boldly, that's exactly right. I don't have to be, no, I can come boldly. It doesn't mean coming presumptuously or whatever, but it means we shouldn't stay away, man. We should be able to fellowship with him. We should be able to come to that throne. Thank God, amen. There's a throne of glory, but right now down here, there's a throne of grace that we can get to when we have to have it. And so and so here the old, in the Old Testament, it was the duty of the priest to offer sacrifices. Well, it appears to me here, in verse 5, it, that, that we have a duty. Notice what it says. Ye are lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood, and what's the purpose? Look at it there, 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So what those priests did in sort of a selective way, now every child of God, every believer is to offer up spiritual sacrifices. I thank God nobody, I, I, let me see, this may make sure. No, I don't hear any, I don't hear any calves mooing. I don't hear any, I don't see any, we don't have any feathers going around here with turtle doves flying around the building. And and, uh, and I don't hear the bleeding of sheep anywhere. You didn't, you didn't pull up with any, did you brother out in your truck? Uh, you know, we don't have that. And so they offered physical sacrifices, but we're to offer some spiritual sacrifices. So let's look at some of those tonight, all right? I said all that to get here. I just needed you to be with me, all right? Be on the same page. And, and, and something you must remember, this is a lifelong occupation. Lifelong. Ever since you've been saved, we're supposed to do that. Well, go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, please. If you'll turn left in your Bible, you go back to Hebrews chapter 13. I want you to see this. Hebrews 13. No, look in verse 15. Here's the first one. Hebrews 13 in verse 15. Hebrews 13. And listen, if you don't know, listen, you have an index in the front of your Bible. Did you know that? Like a table of context. We just call it an index. Why do you think it's in there? 
to help you find out where you're supposed to go. Now, if you've got a real Bible, you'll be on page, let me see, you'll be on page 317. <laughs> I'm just messing with you all, all right? I have a Cambridge here, and so that would be on page 317. Anyway, I want you to see this. Now watch. Everybody there? Hebrews 13, look in verse 15 with me. It says, by him. Now this is through Christ. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. Sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So it says, by him, or because of him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice to, of praise to God continually. And he's going to explain it here. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. The very first spiritual sacrifice, beloved, is the sacrifice of praise. It is the sacrifice of praise. Now listen, you know, and you think about it, boy, don't we have several reasons to praise the Lord? Amen. Don't we have, man, you know, we, we have his propitiation. Look, look with me in verse 11. It says, for the bodies, I'm in chapter 13, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, now watch, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood that we sang about tonight with his own blood suffered without the gate let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach what is this talking about in other words we have his propitiation that's a 25 cent word from the book of first john which simply means appeasement it means to satisfy when we say that that jesus was the propitiation for our sins and not alone but for the whole world when christ died on calvary he satisfied all the holy demands of god and and that was pleasing to the lord and this is something this is the reason why when we do say it is finished that's why I say thank God we're not in here with a bunch of animals and so forth as if we think there was still something yet to be offered. It's not. And so we need to be a people, a praising people, all right? Man, we have his propitiation. We have his path. We have his promise. Now, now watch. He said, for, you know, his promise is that there is a cup, there's a city to come. Verse 14, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Now, listen. That city whose builder and maker, like Abraham, that city whose builder and maker is God. We're, we're going to heaven one day. We're on a path. That's not going to change. We have a place reserved for us in heaven. In other words, man, we, we have the sacrifice that Christ made, that God was satisfied with. It's ours when we placed our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus and God was granted to us. We were given his righteousness we have, we have a will that we can follow. We have a lot of reasons to be a praising people. Yes, amen. We really do. We have a lot of reasons for it. Listen, I, I know things get tough. I, I know that you get weary. I've got flesh just like yours. I groan sometimes. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm like that old cereal, Rice Krispies. I snap, crackle, and pop. Sometimes I do, just like how y'all do. But man, but I thank God for every day that I can draw a breath, that I can talk to someone, that I get to visit with you, get to preach or whatever. Man, there's a lot of things I'm grateful for. Why? That he has provided, given us a purpose in life. Well, before we got saved, we did, you know, I don't know about you, but I was just sort of treading water. But when we got born again, man, God, you know, just like, just like what the psalmist said, man, he, I, he pulled me out of that miry clay. He set my feet upon a solid rock and established my goals. I think the next verse says, and he put a song in my heart. Amen. Why? Amen. That we should be a praising people. And praise is calmly. That word calmly. Do you know what it means? It means it's suitable. It means it's right to praise the Lord. And you and I, we need to, we need to do, a, a, we need to be about that business. And it's a sacrifice that you may not think that, that really that it means all that much, but I'm telling you, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And, uh, and he's worthy of it. You think about it. I mean, you know, it's, it's, there's a song that we sing. We haven't learned it yet, but I'm hoping that we will one day. Ladies, you, uh, you orchestra people, all right? And it's called When We See Christ. Do you know that song? 
Oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tossed and driven on. I messed it up. Uh, you know, no human help in sight, but there's one in heaven who knows our deepest care. It says, man, just take, bring your problems to Jesus. You know, that's what it's saying, man. It, and you know, the latter part of that, the chorus says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, Amen. all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Man, that's not, I mean, I, I butchered that up bad, but it's still the truth. Amen. Still the truth. When we see Christ, you know, I, ladies, I mean, I've watched... When I was going through uh, the, the, all my clinicals and so forth, I saw nine deliveries one day. I had, I had to do L and D. I had to do labor and delivery. You know, uh, anyway, had had to do all that. And, and, and there were nine of them that were delivered that day. And I watched the expressions, and I heard the sounds, and I saw the sights, and everything. I had to do all that. You know, and I think about it. But yet, when when that labor was over, and they and they gave that child to that mother, she just smiled. It really was, as the Bible said, you know, that a man child had been brought in the world. She's not thinking about any of those things. Why? Man, you think about how our lives have changed. You just think about how they've been improved. The peace of God that you've had. The blessings of God in this life. You can pillow your head at night regardless of the circumstances and know you have a father in heaven that's watching over you tonight. No wonder, man, that we can praise the Lord. No wonder that these things are ours. And I mean, you know, listen, it will help. Listen, if you will keep the finish line first in your mind, we are headed somewhere. Amen. And, and, and there is a finish line out there. I'll just tell you that there is. That's why Paul was able to press on towards that prize. Why? He was keeping the finish line first in his mind. And I know between here and there, there's a lot of life struggles and there's a lot of things that challenge us and that, and that come along to distract us or to discourage us. But it, had, it has not and it cannot change the fact that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ on that day when you trusted him. And God is very much aware of all those things. Beloved, we need to be able to praise him just for who he is. Listen, you know, he, he, listen, you know what? Even when you and I praise him, even when things are tough, it pleases God. That's why it's called. Notice what it says. The sacrifice of praise to God. How, how often do we do it? Continually. Continually. That's why I said these are lifelong occupations. That we're going to look at, you know, some of you, you just thought you was a school teacher, a bus driver, a horseshoer. No, you have an occupation. You and I, we're to be praising the Lord. Amen. That's what we're to, that's what we are to be doing. And so, and so here we have this sacrifice of praise and, uh, and the Lord loves it. I mean, he does. He loves it. The fruit of our lips giving thanks. You know, it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to thank God and grumble at the same time, isn't it? It's hard to do that. that that's, why the, that's why the scripture says in the book of Philippians that we're to do all things without murmuring and disputing. A murmuring is something that takes place down on the inside. Maybe beneath your breath a little bit. You murmur a little bit. You gripe a little bit. And then it, when it becomes a dispute is when you open your mouth and you let that out. And I'm just saying, beloved, we don't have to express everything that we think or feel. Amen, brother. We don't, we don't have to say everything that we think or feel. But it is suitable. It is calmly. It is right. And it's a sacrifice that God is well pleased with when his children thank him. When they talk about him. Keep your place right there. I want you to mark that. And I want you to go to the book of Malachi. If you'll go to Matthew and then turn left. Find Matthew, New Testament, first book of the New Testament. 
Find Matthew. And I want you to look in, in Malachi chapter 3. Just go, just go one book over from Matthew to the book of Malachi. And look in chapter 3. Now the prophet here is going to get on the people. Look what he says. Look in um, chapter 3. Look what he says in verse 13. The Lord here is speaking through Malachi to the nation. He said, your words have been stout against me. Saith the Lord. Yet you say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. This is what they were saying. This is how far removed they were, how backslidden they were, how hard-hearted they had become. Because you know what happened to Israel over there in the Old Testament in part was because of the choices that they had made in rejecting the Father, in rejecting Jehovah. But look at, but look at verse 16. Notice what it says. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. Look what he says. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. What am, I, what am I trying to say? Listen, when you and I are talking about the goodness of God in our conversations, in our fellowship, and we're talking about the faithfulness of God, what are we doing? We're giving praise. We're, we're praising. And, and, and what are we doing? We're actually doing something to help others. Go back with me. Go back to Hebrews with me. And I want you to see the second thing. But God notes that. He said, then they that feared the Lord and were talking about him and expressed those things, he wrote that down in the book. Not only are we to offer up the sacrifices of praise, but there are sacrifices here in verse 16 of both a pattern as well as a provocation. I want you to see it. Look in verse 16. Notice what he says. I'm back in Hebrews 13. And look in verse 16. This is all a part of this same statement. Giving thanks to his name. That's the last part in verse 15. Verse 16 says, But to do good and to communicate forget not, now watch, for with such sacrifices, God is what? Well pleased to do good. What are we, what are we talking about here? Listen, listen to what this says. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 10 and verse 38, it says, and, and Peter here was writing, said, or was speaking, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Now watch, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. There's a pattern here to do good. Why is that? And it's a sacrifice to do good because it's not always easy to do some of those things. You know, mercy and charitable actions. You know what we're doing? We're actually imitating part of, the, part of that wonderful nature about God. Man, you know... When I was a kid, and sometimes I forget where I learned it, I don't, not, I'm not exactly sure, but there was a little prayer. It said, uh, oh, yeah, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for this food, right? God is great, God is good. I don't, I, that just came to me, I hadn't thought about that in a long time, but I, but I know that was out there. I'm not exactly sure who taught that to me or where I heard that from, because we were not frequently, we did not frequent churches when I was a boy, particularly of that age or whatever. But I just know this, that it's in God's nature to want to do good. I mean, why in the world? He loved men and he sent his son to die because he loved us. That's that whole peace on earth, goodwill towards men. That was God's goodwill to us. So beloved, when you and I have a pattern of good works about our life, what are we doing? Well, it's not about making a name for ourselves, but we're just following in the footsteps of our Savior. Everywhere he went, when he got done with something, they thanked God 
on his behalf. They weren't walking around praising Jesus. They were around there praising God. And the Lord Jesus was honoring his father in the good works that he did. And he said, hey, the, the will that I'm doing is not my own, but that of the father. And so, beloved, when you and I have a pattern of good works about our life, not only are we appraising people, but we're following the pattern that the Lord Jesus left for us. And in, what do they say about imitation? Don't they say that imitation is the highest form of of praise? Yes, they do. And so when you and I occupy our times with, with if, if looking for opportunities to do good, you know, the Lord had a compassion about him, didn't he? he even, even when they came, even when their reason for coming was not good and their motives were not right, he didn't withhold the food. He didn't withhold the healing. I mean, you know, a lot of people think that Jesus wept because he was weep. Oh, John eleven thirty five, the shortest verse in the Bible. All right, that was an easy one to memorize. John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. A lot of people think, and I've heard it used. They take and make an application out of it. I, I have a hard time with it. They say, oh, he's weeping because he loved Lazarus. So I, I disagree with that. I, I don't disagree with the fact that he loved Lazarus. But if it was so important to get to Lazarus, why did he delay a couple more days when he found out that Lazarus was sick? He even tells his disciples in John chapter 11, he said, man, th th this is for the glory of God. So I think he wept over the unbelief of Mary. Because Mary said to him, you know, if you'd been here, she was echoing what Martha, who was not, always, she was a busy person, but wasn't always the most spiritual person. And she said, you know, master, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. And you read just a couple of verses that Jesus wept. And even those around him said, oh, look, he's weeping because he loves, he loves Lazarus. That was not it. I think he was grieving over Mary's unbelief. But it did not hold him back from dealing with Lazarus. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. If he'd have just said, come forth, guess who'd have got up? All of them in there, Kendra. They all would have got up. Because that was a voice to be obeyed, wasn't it? Amen. There'll come a time when that voice is going to sound out and the graves are going to be open. There'll come a time for that. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. And out he came. And those bedclothes, they removed them from him. Man, he went about doing good. And you and I, we, uh, now listen, I, I, don't, I don't know that you're in here raising the dead or whatever, those kind of things. But my point is, is that we have opportunities to do good. We have opportunities to show compassion. The Bible says, by truth and mercy, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Mm. By mercy and truth. You know, as, as we exercise some of these things, I think, when, I think when a child of God is really saved, I think they have a sense of compassion to see the needs of other people. Now, ladies are very good at this. Br brethren, you and I, not so much. We just look at, well, gosh, what's, you know, but a lot of women are a lot more sensitive to other things about in a family. You and I, we just sort of take the, the black and white, you know, either right or wrong. If it's broke, we'll fix it and so forth. But women have a little bit more of a, they have a tender, compassionate, side to them maybe it's been a while since you've experienced that brother but they do have one all right i'm trying to help you out here man i'm trying i'm trying to promote marital harmony here <clears throat> but we should be you know what did jeremiah say he said mine eye hath affected mine heart And so too it ought to be with us that we're looking for opportunities to do good. It's a sacrifice that God is well pleased with. What does it say there? What does it say? Communicate but to do good and to communicate forget not. Now watch. With such sacrifices God is well pleased. Do you want to please him? Then look for some opportunities to be a blessing. To be a blessing. It might be a note of encouragement. It might, it might just you know, it just, it might be, maybe maybe you're walking into town and you see somebody struggling, they're trying to put their groceries in the back of their car, some lady or pregnant mother, whatever, and just walk over there and say, ma'am, I can help you with that. I mean, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to get y'all to be Boy Scouts, but what I'm trying to say is that God looks on those things and is pleased. Why? 
because you're representing him and you're representing him very well, representing his nature toward man. Listen, who was hell created for? The Bible says for the devil and his angels. It wasn't created for men, but men got caught in a trap that belonged to the rat. My Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I think the Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the Bible says. So doing good, being a blessing. I'm not, try, I'm not preaching a social gospel. I'm just talking about the way that we treat other people, the way that we can do some things. It represents our Lord very well. And these are things that are well-pleasing unto him. And so having that spirit of charity, I mean, if you read, if you read uh, 1 Corinthians 13, man, if there's, no, if there's no charity in your speech, you're sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. If there's no charity in your sacrifices, you're nothing. If there's no charity in your service, it's useless. We have to have that. Look at this last thing. Look, look at this. Look, notice the last part of that. It says to do good. And look at the second part. And to communicate, forget not. It may not be something physical for you to do, lifting the bag or whatever or helping your neighbor. But it might just be a word of encouragement, a word of comfort. I'm in verse 16, that's right. A word of comfort. Just having a word. You know, everybody, can, you know, kindness is something that goes a long way and everybody needs a little encouragement every now and then. Just telling someone, man, oh, that was, you did a good job. Or, or you did that for me, a, a kindness for me. Boy, I appreciate that. And let, let me tell you about somebody who was kind to me also. Man, that's an open door for you. To be able to talk to the Lord about that. Talk to them about the Lord, I should say. So a word of encouragement. It might be a word of exhortation. Maybe sometimes to challenge your brother, to help him get up. We all have to have that sometimes. Sometimes discouraging things come along. And you got to be told, I mean, did, did, did any of y'all ever, you know, be in team sports? When you were in school, wasn't there... What did they call those people with the pom-poms and everything? What were they called? The cheerleaders. They weren't just nice to look at, but they were saying things to get everybody, to get the stands encouraged, to encourage the players, right? Everybody needs a little encouragement. You know, in Louisiana, they say hot boudin and cold cush cush. Come on, team, let's push, push, push. Amen, that's what they say. Don't y'all know what cush cush is? It's cornbread, like day, two-day-old cornbread that you put it with some milk and put a little sugar on it. You eat it, it's called Kush Kush. I've got to educate you Texas people, I'm telling you. I'm almost done. Man, we just shouldn't forget. Communicate, forget not. Forget not what? Forget not the goodness of God. Forget not what our purpose is. Forget not that there is a finish line. Forget not about keep going and being faithful. Doesn't it say that? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, but what? But exhorting one another daily. That's an encouragement. Come to the house of God. Come be in on the fellowship. It'll help you. It'll strengthen you. Sometimes it's words of enthusiasm. Man, when you come in and you go, and, and just like brother, when you come in and you hear the songs, it ah, it, it does something for you, doesn't it? Amen, it does. And your enthusiasm, listen, enthusiasm is contagious. Just like how fear is. And so I'm not talking about a Disney World smile now and something fake. I'm just talking about something, a reality about who we are and who he is and what he's done for us. Man, the sacrifice, the sacrifices, these patterns and provocations that we should have. And then let me give you the last one. I'm going to be done. Look in Romans 12. And I know you know this one. It is the sacrifice of your person. What does Romans 12, 1 say? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
Giving yourself to him is really is the greatest sacrifice that one can make. That's why I left it for last. Just consider how much mercy that you and I have already received. Amen. That's what he said by the mercies of God. And what, if you don't know what those are, go back and read the first 11 chapters. And then when you get up to chapter 12 and you read verse 1, it'll make a lot more sense because you'll see where we came from, what he did for us, how he's empowered us in chapter 6. <clears throat> given us the victory in chapter 7. Romans chapter 8 comes along. Now we have the Holy Spirit to help our infirmities. And so it's a blessing to give yourself away, to give you the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of those provocations and patterns of good works, the sacrifice of your person. When you consider what our past has been forgiven, you know, the, the book of Proverbs 28, verse 1 says this. It says, the wicked flee when no man pursue it. You know what they're doing? They keep looking over their shoulder. Man, are they going to get me today? They look over their shoulder. Are they going to get me today? You know, they try, they try to sneak. Aren't you glad, man, all that's gone? That's right. Amen. That's right. I mean, and, and think about it. We have not reaped everything that we have sown. Wow. Psalm 103 says he has not dealt with us after our iniquities. Yes. As far as the heavens are above the earth, as far as the east is from the west. I mean, it, it, now, I know this may not mean much to you, but think about it now. You think about the brothers and sisters that we have been given. You know, if you hadn't got saved and I hadn't got saved, we probably would have never met. It is our fellowship in the gospel. You think about the people that you've known over the years, like the Martins and others and others that have come through here, the missionaries and the like. No wonder, no wonder the book of Colossians says, by him all things consist. He's the one that holds it together. Amen. The church that you attend. It's a blessing because of that. It's a blessing, man. I remember, you know what I got here? You unorthodox Baptists, I'm telling you, you know. I told Brother Martin about what you said, Brother, on that day. And he said, yeah, these people, he said, they, they don't know when to go home. They don't, know, they don't know any of that stuff. Yeah, he was right. Because they're going to have church. Because this means something in your life. Not a building, but it's each other and his presence that makes all the difference. Man, it does. It does. I mean, you know. It really shouldn't be that much of a sacrifice when you think about it. That's the reason why he said it's our reasonable service. It's just reasonable <clears throat> after what he's done. Wow. Some spiritual sacrifices. And I'm telling you, these things are important to God. He values them highly. And again, I'll say this is to be a lifelong occupation. The sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice, if you will, those patterns of good works and helping others communicating to forget not and the sacrifice of your person. That means laying aside your ambition, your will, your desires, laying them at the Father's feet and saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And we do that on a daily basis. It's not, a, it's not an act. A one-time act? No, it's an attitude that we should have. Amen? All right, let's stand. We'll be dismissed. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you for your patience tonight. I'm telling you, you know, you don't realize it, but you're praising him, you're sacrificing, and God's taking note of it. He's taking note of it, and it pleases him. Well-pleasing are these things. Father, Thank you, Lord, for the precious word of God. And I thank you, Lord, that our Heavenly Father is so easy to please. Lord, we pray that, uh, Lord, that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts this week, God, will be acceptable, be pleasing in your sight. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we may see these as opportunities, Lord, to glorify you. And I pray they'd be a sweet-smelling savor in your nostrils as those sacrifices of the Old Testament times of the Levitical priesthood. I pray that these, Lord, of this economy, this New Testament, would be as pleasing or more to you. We love you tonight, Father. Thank you for your faithfulness. And I pray you'll bless our people now as they go to their homes. 
We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.